Northwest Now is supported, in part, by viewers like you. Thank you. For six million years, five species of Pacific salmon and their closely related steelhead cousins swam the vast waters of Alaska, navigated back to the Salish Sea, drove through the powerful currents of their home river, and built delicate nests to reproduce and repeat the epic cycle. It only took 100 years for man to almost wipe them out. What happened? Hydroelectric dams blocked migration and altered the hydrology. Habitat was destroyed by old-time logging practices and the taming of rivers and floodplains for development and agriculture. Harvest levels exploded as the technology improved, and the world's largest hatchery system built to mitigate population declines only masked the problem and made it worse. As salmon moved onto the endangered species list, the focus sharpened to the four H's, hydro, harvest, hatcheries, and the one the federal government identified as key, habitat. Today, salmon are almost cliché, perhaps viewed more as a tourist attraction or novelty rather than the backbone of a billion-dollar industry or the linchpin of native culture. But in reality, thousands of people, including the region's most prominent Native American tribes, are spending millions of dollars trying to undo the recent past, trying to save the salmon. For 100 years, two dams on the Elwha River blocked the spawning grounds for 400,000 salmon and steelhead. In what may be the most dramatic restoration project ever conceived, those dams were knocked down a few years ago. Looking down from a remaining chunk of the Glines Canyon Dam, tribal member Robert Ellefson hopes fish will run here again someday. While natural spawners still number below 200, hatchery return numbers have already bounced up from the hundreds and into the thousands. We've had 4,500 Chinook. We expect up to 35,000 annually in this river, 30,000 coho, uh, 35,000 chum, and about 10,000 um, steelhead. And on pink years, we expect an average of about 192,000 pinks. But between now and then, streamside or riparian habitat has to mount a major comeback. The former reservoir areas are still flushing out sediment, and the half million native plants planned for the project need to take hold to filter water and shade the river. At the mouth, the Elwha used to flush fish straight out into the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Now, a larger fish-friendly estuary has grown to more than 80 acres. The estuary restoration, we've already got a uh, tremendous amount of increased estuary area, but now the ecosystem has to return. Uh, the uh, revegetation on the reservoir areas are also important, and uh, those are uh, well on their way. The, at the the uh, the Elwha Dam's been out since March of uh, completely out since March of 2012, and it's well on its way to recovery as far as vegetation. And the Glines Canyon's just been out since. August of last year, and it is, uh, it's, it's recovering, but it has a lot farther to go than the Elwha. Full restoration will take up to 30 years, but the Elwha are trying to recover native runs while producing hatchery fish. It's controversial and the subject of a lawsuit, but like many of the Salish Sea tribes, saving the salmon also means exercising treaty rights and fishing. I was a kid, you know, down here with my mom and my dad fishing this river. To have that part of my culture, the time spent down here with my family, my mother, my grandparents, being, you know, it's just who we are. And to have that back and to hope that it'll be back, I, it's, I, you know, it's great to see the fish going back past the dams. Charles says the Elwha are a salmon people a sentiment shared by most, if not all, of the other Salish Sea tribes. This tiny fall-run Chinook salmon, recently identified as a unique race, is among the last of its kind. Fall run on the south fork of the Stiligwamish River are close to extinction, with only 30 fish returning in 2014. So for now, the hatchery is the only hope, 
and not just for hatching the thousands of fingerlings released into the river in the diminishing hopes of a return, but for raising a select group of natives all the way to adulthood so another generation can be guaranteed. It's called a captive brood program, and this is how the Stiligwamish tribe and its many partners are trying to keep a race of fish from extinction. The trend line is, is definitely, when you look at it over time, it's definitely dropping you know, pretty quickly. It's, it's fluctuated back and forth, but we're all concerned at this point that it's, you know, it's getting you know, perilously low, which is why we have to go in with a captive brood program. At first blush, the Stiligwamish looks nice enough, but a hundred years ago, levees were built to protect farms, eliminating the quiet waters of a floodplain and its fish-friendly beaver ponds. Along upstream creeks, the problems were road building, logging, and blowing out beneficial log jams for navigation. One of the first things they did was get the wood out, and wood is very critical to forming the channel, so it creates pool habitat, you know, it, it separates the sediment out so the larger boulders and the gravel the fish spawn in gets uh, sorted, finer material goes down towards bay. But basically the infrastructure that people build, the highways, the bridges, the, it just all detracts from the natural processes that rivers like. About $30 million has been spent so far trying to recreate the old habitat, putting log jams back into places like Pilchuck Creek, replanting 400 acres, and connecting it all to quiet ponds where tiny salmon can grow and hide from predators. But one of the big worries on the Stiligwamish can't be fixed with local or even regional projects. Climate change is already taking a toll on the few fish that build nests or reds to spawn in the river. And the hydrology in the river is all, all whacked out now with uh, climate change and we get these strong cells that come in and we've got an increasing trend of peak flows, bigger flows more often, which is very hard on the fish. The other part of climate change is water temperature. On the Stiligwamish, if trends continue, temperatures could move into the lethal zone by the year 2040. All across Puget Sound, river valleys and wetlands ended up being ports or graded and tamed for development or agriculture. That's why the Nisqually tribe is focused on restoring places like this, an example of the ditch that was Ohop Creek, one of only two tributaries to the Nisqually River. But after 19 landowners and the tribe got together, three miles of the Ohop were transformed into this meandering, gently graded creek. Thousands of native plants were installed to provide shade and cover, along with specially engineered log jams where fish like to hang out without fear of predators. When combined with land acquisitions in the Nisqually's headwaters, the hope is the Spring Chinook, extinct in the mid-60s, might come back with the help of a hatchery program managed to encourage in-stream spawning and facilitate the slow conversion of green river fish into a new native race of Nisqually fish. David Trout leads several of the major governing bodies overseeing salmon recovery in western Washington. He finds himself trying to balance the tension between tribes that want to produce fish for harvest and those who want less fishing and less hatchery production to spark wild runs on projects like the OHOP. Well, the, I th the science is leading us towards a path of managing hatcheries in a way that's consistent with recovery, and it may not meet the agendas of a lot of groups out there who think hatcheries should go away. But hatcheries managed properly with environmental habitat uh, restoration can work together to protect salmon and restore salmon. And given the fact that we've got two and a half million people in Puget Sound and another two million coming in, in the next 20 years, we're going to have to find creative ways to maintain these fish in the wild and to um, uphold our treaty obligations to the tribes. So it's going to have to be a, a complex solution, not a simple one. Anybody who says it's a simple answer is lying to you. Despite all the efforts being made on places like Ohop Creek, however, the numbers continue to disappoint. The most desirable salmon populations all show the same thing, a big downward move and then a steady flat line, just holding on at the bottom. Chinook are the most worrisome with 17 of the 22 remaining runs listed under the Endangered Species Act. 
Their absence has all but killed sport and commercial fishing in Puget Sound and put food supply pressure on the Sound's 80 remaining orca. While hatcheries produce millions of fish, they're not making it back. So ultimately, trout and others like them are just about sure the problem for Chinook, Coho, and Steelhead lies in the vast waters of the Puget Sound, where there are too many predators, too few bait fish, and a severe loss of nearshore habitat to cement bulkheads and riprap. All the work that we're doing in the freshwater is incredibly important, but we have to also be successful in the marine environment. And Puget Sound is changing. We're still losing habitat faster than we can restore it. The latest information I've seen still says we're losing nearshore habitat at about a mile a, a mile a year. Uh, we've got to stop that. We've got to reverse that trend. We've got to get ahead of that. And I think the path to get there ultimately is, again, working with landowners along shorelines to educate them to what their role is and then finding opportunities to restore some of the lost habitat that we've lost over years. <music> Chief Seattle's gravestone might seem like a reminder of the Squamish tribe's ancient history, but relative to their relationship with salmon, Seattle's death in 1866 is recent history. So is the effort to bring chum salmon back to Cowling Creek, a little stream that flows into Miller Bay and is another example of how just one change can wipe out a productive salmon run. Innocent looking road culverts destroyed fish passage here, the final straw of decades of unwitting habitat destruction in the creek's watershed. We took out the beaver dams and in many cases we created barriers unintentionally or willingly. A lot of road culverts were not impassable initially but became so after many high flow events and uh, many barriers. Uh, here on Cowling Creek uh, we'll be working toward removing the culverts that were put in in 1935 and are 100% impassable to all anadromous fish. Volunteers truck fish around the culverts and have put makeshift ladders into place trying to move fish. And eventually, doing things like taking out the culverts is not only good for fish. Dorn says it's part of living up to the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. We've done a huge disservice to tribes. When they signed the treaties and we promised uh, to allow them to hunt and fish in their usual and accustomed places, uh, the fact that the natural resources are so diminished in many cases and we all lose, um, whether we're sport hunters or sport fishermen, um, it's a shared resource. If we work together, we make the pie bigger, everybody's slices bigger. The tribe's efforts can also be seen over on nearby Chico Creek. The signs of restoration are everywhere, including the installation of native plants, fish-friendly log jams, and large replanting and restoration efforts that extend miles upstream. The chum salmon have returned to Chico Creek and are the stock for the program on Cowling Creek. The hope is that they'll increase and maybe also attract more nomad steelhead and coho too, just like the old days. As is the case all across Puget Sound, volunteers are a big part of the effort on Cowling Creek too. Brian Kenward helps restore creekside habitat and feed the tiny chum fry who zoom back and forth in the rearing pond. Every little bit matters, uh, and, the, and the volunteering that I've done, I've seen what many hands can do. When you do it and you tell people about it, next thing you know they're interested in it, pretty soon you have a group of people. Next thing, maybe the whole world. Our eyes are used to seeing channelized rivers and thinking they look normal, but they're really just ditches designed to make room for agriculture and move floodwaters quickly to the sound. All across western Washington, rivers that look like this hinder fish production. Because when rivers are brought together, they tend to move too fast. So you don't get the spawning gravels, you don't get the food sources, fish can't hang out in the right places. Um, you, you miss a lot of the nutrient content. And then from a community standpoint, if you try to confine that river, you're, you're setting up a situation where there's going to be an overtop too. So the, the need to actually set the levees back and give that river room to flow benefits the habitat, it benefits the fish, it benefits the communities. Uh, you know, supplying food for the fish, supplying spawning, rearing, overwintering habitats. These days along the Tolts northern shore as it flows past Carnation, there is room for salmon to hide out in slower water. And on the other side of the tree line, channels connect the river to land that has been purchased and dedicated to floodplain. So when the flows are right, the fish can move into the quiet water. 
NOAA is a big picture federal organization that has listed Chinook and Steelhead under the Endangered Species Act and monitors the entire Pacific coast. But Jennifer Steger works on habitat restoration for NOAA and cites this effort along the Tolt as an example of what can happen when the dozens of stakeholders that emerge for every project can be convinced to work together. You need the vision to be able to work with each other to determine what needs to be done. And you need a lot of patience because when we're going through these processes and we're addressing these multiple needs within a community, you need to develop a multiple benefit funding strategy and you also need to be able to be open-minded enough to not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. That's the only way that we're going to end up re restoring salmon and the habitat because if you stake it all on, we need to do only the perfect habitat projects at the expense of other things, you're immediately setting up an adversarial situation and you're getting into your own silos. That also limits your funding sources. Phil Roney is a NOAA research scientist who says to make real progress, 20% of a river's entire watershed needs to be restored to see an increase in fish populations. So while the demonstration project like the Tolt River levee setback is a good thing, it needs to be multiplied many times over region-wide on the big rivers to save the threatened species in Puget Sound. But for Chinook salmon, we're talking about large rivers like the Snoqualmie or the, the Tolt River behind me, uh, where we're really talking about um, setting back levees or protecting areas like this. Um, and that's some, you know, that's some big expensive stuff, and it's in places where people like to live. Unfortunately, the best salmon habitat and the best wildlife habitat is often in the valleys, in the estuaries, where people like to live and build houses and industry. So, um, I, you know, I think the two biggest messages are, are really the scale of the restoration and then, um, you know, we're going to be working in probably along big rivers and floodplains a lot and that's going to be expensive work. At the Puyallup Tribe's Dairu Hatchery, the concern is steelhead, down to just 125 fish at one point. Like the Chinook on the Stillaguamish, this is a captive brood program where about a dozen pair of fish are raised to adulthood to produce about 30,000 juveniles. And then some of those fish are kept to do the same, preserving the wild gene pool and guaranteeing a brood stock. So basically every time we go in to grab some brood stock, they're wild fish, and all the fish that are returning from our program uh, you know, we, they actually have a coded wire tag in their head. Actually, it's just a blank wire tag, but they have a tag in their head, and we can detect that tag, and then we're passing those fish up so they can spawn. The Puyallup White and Carbon River Complex suffers the same problems as every other major watershed in western Washington. Headwater habitat was heavily logged, roads run everywhere and messed up the hydrology, and human development encroached all across the floodplains, meaning the rivers were almost completely channelized and riprapped. White River Chinook got down to a count of 20 before state, federal, and tribal partnerships got them off the brink of extinction to about 2,000. So it's a long road back, but fish like the steelhead may at least be moving off the brink of extinction. Steelhead live on after spawning, so that means Blake Smith is able to return this year's breeders to the river, where they might provide an unexpected thrill for local sport fishermen. But as is the case everywhere else around the Sound, the threatened steelhead and Chinook on the White River face an ominous threat in the form of a major blockage. In this case, the Corps of Engineers' controversial Buckley Diversion Dam, built without fish passage, and that the Puyallups and Muckleshoot say is a fish killer in need of improved traps. Despite that, though, for now, the captive brood program seems to be working for the steelhead, even though, as is the case everywhere, numbers are far short of recovery goals. Since we started the program, the, the numbers have increased. We actually have an average of about 500 fish coming back now. So we're seeing good results from that program, and uh, we're going to continue it. And hopefully uh, the things that are affecting steelhead survival in the salt water um, We'll turn around and maybe we won't have to do the program anymore, but it, we are getting more fish on the spawning grounds and so we're, we are, and the river it's, itself is producing more fish. If you wait long enough, you can see tiny coho salmon dart around in Weiss Creek just south of Duval. 
The restoration of the creek is a 15-year effort on the part of the Wild Fish Conservancy, but the Conservancy's Director of Science, Jamie Glasgow, insists that we cannot restore our way to recovery, that it's going to take an aggressive push to encourage wild fish at the even further expense of the state's nearly 150 hatchery programs and the recreational, commercial, and tribal fishing they support. Glasgow says hatchery fish just cannot be kept from spawning with wild fish and that their sheer numbers overwhelm and further threaten the already legally threatened natives. Hatchery fish production has genetic impacts on wild fish when the hatchery fish aren't harvested uh, and are able to spawn in the wild with wild fish populations. If you can think of wild fish as wolves and hatchery fish as Labrador retrievers, for example, I have a lab so I think I can say that. Um, that's a perfect example and I think it's completely appropriate and, and I'm not overreaching here. Hatchery fish are domesticated just like dogs, Labrador retrievers are domesticated wolves. And the analogy plays through. If you can imagine a Labrador retriever reproducing with a wolf in the wild, the offspring from that pairing is going to be less able to survive in the wild. And that's exactly what the science shows happens with fish. When hatchery fish reproduce with hatchery fish in the wild, the offspring are a fraction of as successful as wild, wild pairings. And that's all well and good. The real problem happens when hatchery fish spawn with wild fish in the wild. And when that happens, the delivery of those maladapted genes, those domesticated genes to the wild populations has very real and measurable negative impacts on that wild population. It erodes the fitness and the relative reproductive success of that wild population. And that population is over time dragged down and is much less productive. No matter how productive the habitat it's in, it's much less productive than it was before in the absence of hatchery fish. In a nutshell, the Conservancy's lawsuit claims that despite many reforms over the past decade, current hatchery operations have not been reviewed under the rubric of the Endangered Species Act and are therefore being operated by all parties illegally. I should get these guys back in the water. The WFC lost the first hearing and appealed, continuing to argue that the salmon's flatline populations and poor adaptation to declining ocean conditions prove hatcheries and the harvest they support just aren't working. We've grown used to being able to, to catch and harvest fish at, um, at levels which, uh, honestly, the populations we have today can't sustain. And the way we've been able to do that is through production of, of hatchery fish in these, um, in these engineered um, approaches that, uh, unfortunately, have negative impacts for the wild fish that we're, we're actually trying to recover. Uh, and so it really is going to be an uphill battle and an, uh, I think a, a real sea change is needed uh, to, to reset society's expectations when it comes to wild fish recovery. We may not be able to have our fish and eat them too in some locations. There's going to be places where hatchery production and harvest are incompatible with wild fish recovery. Are hatcheries going to bring back salmon? No, because all we can really do is hang on to them until we fix the habitat that's degraded. Could they provide a fishery in an appropriately designed program? I believe they could, um, an appropriately, you know, appropriately sized program. And so uh, if our goal as a, as a community and a region is, is to recover wild populations, then all we can do is hang on to those populations until we get the, the hard work of habitat restoration done. We recognize you know, the impact hatchery production had on wild fish and does have in many cases. The wild fish have been around a long time and that genetic diversity and their abundance has ensured their survival. Whether volcanoes go off, glaciers come and go, forest fires happen. But when we showed up on the picture, Europeans in large numbers, we've really thrown the curve at wild fish. I think hatcheries can play a role um, in recovering salmon populations. Um, I just don't think they're the, they're the, they're the solution uh, or a long-term solution. And they tend to, to mask the problem. You know, we've, we've ignored a lot of the habitat problems because we could just pump out more hatchery fish and, and keep that ignoring it. And we can't keep ignoring it any longer. In the meanwhile, though, tribes like the Elwha, named in the litigation, argue that while sediment is coming down from the old reservoirs, they are going to exercise what they see as their sovereign right to produce fish until the river can support an all-wild population. And the sovereignty issue is a big one for tribes that have been told just to be patient for 100 years. 
If you grew up in Western Washington, you remember what the salmon used to be. And what's amazing is that even then, the fish were in decline. Now, we're in a holding pattern hoping we can figure out the problems in the saltwater and restore habitat while we still have some fish to work with. The bottom line, with another 2 million people heading to Western Washington in the next 25 years, a big recovery is going to mean more pain for developers, farmers, fishermen, taxpayers, and tribes. And while we're not likely to repeat the fish wars of the 1970s, there will be battles over deciding how that pain is distributed. I hope this program got you thinking and talking. To watch this program again or to share it with others, it streams on our website at kbtc.org. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at Northwest Now. Thanks for taking a closer look on this edition of Northwest Now. Until next time, I'm Tom Layson. Thanks for watching.